Welcome everybody and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Karen Miller and I'm founder of Prevention is the Cure and a great committee of people and some great panelists put this event together. I'm going to be learning as some of you, I assume a lot of you even know the inside story, so I am exhilarated to actually be learning something today. That's always the best day, right, when you wake up and you learn something more. So I put together a few remarks and housekeeping will be, I'm going to give the remarks. We're going to see Allison Johnson's outrageously powerful documentary. And then miraculously we put together a group of panelists and it is our hope that we will have interactive action planning conversations. So certainly we're not here to entertain you, we're here to stimulate you and to get us to the next level of action. So bear with me, I just put together a few short remarks. It's a mess. How come we always wait for people to get sick to take action? Sure it's understandable that selfless men and women rushed to help everyone and everything in Lower Manhattan. Shortly after that infamous day, workers were told to go back to their desks and continue working. Residents who lived in Lower Manhattan neighborhoods were told to go back to their homes, dust off their clothes, and start all over again. And heroic blue-collar workers, medical personnel, all kinds of volunteers were given mixed messages about the need for protective gear as they selflessly rushed to lend their hands during those dark hours. So far, 70% of the responders reported toxic health effects since that cataclysmic event. Make no mistake, this is only the tip of the iceberg. How many generations are going to be affected? Today we're here to lend support because the needs of our community are huge. Today we'll be exploring the toxic consequences of 9-11 through a documentary and an expert panel discussion. We must join together and insist that the health needs of those affected by 9-11 be properly attended to. Tragedy has returned a second time to too many families because of this event. But as we join together in this fight, we must also remember that there are thousands of families struggling with their own toxic poisonings. We are a reactive society. We tell corporations, place your products on the market and we'll hope for the best. Europe has started down a different path, implementing the precautionary principle in a wide range of laws and health practices. We must work together to pass precautionary legislation in New York State and at the federal level to help ensure the health of our citizens. What occurred in a New York minute an explosion of toxic substances instantly caused harmful health effects because the products inside those buildings contain tons, tons of toxic materials. Make no mistake, we're exposed to these and other toxins every day in subtle and insidious ways. Many in this audience and our panel members will address this issue today. Prevention is the Cure has organized this event so that Long Islanders and those of you who travel from beyond Long Island, as far as Chicago are you, can gain more information about the enormous pain and suffering that rescue workers now struggle with every day. PITC believes that we must always draw upon the best scientific knowledge and use that information to ensure the safety and well-being of all citizens. We have to work together to ensure that future generations live a healthier world minimizing the use of toxic chemicals. Today's theme, transparency, accountability, and reform. Thank you all for coming. At this point, again, as I said before, we're going to see the documentary. We're going to engage the panel in discussion. I'm going to be introducing some um, uh, representatives from our, of our elected officials here, and I just wanted to take a moment. We have a representative here from our senator, Hillary Rodham Clinton's office. Um, she was on Long Island um, yesterday for an event for breast cancer, and I'd like to ask that Joyce Leonard just come up and say a few words. The applause goes to all of you who are fighting this battle. Um, I just wanted to bring greetings from the senator. Uh, I believe that we have a moral obligation as a nation to take care of those who took care of us as a way of demonstrating our solidarity and commitment to them 
and honoring their resilience and courage in the face of the terrorist attacks. Um, just recently, aside from the original um, Mount Sinai um, uh, monies that she got uh, that amounted to about $12 million that she led the fight for, for the um, test, and you've all heard the results of that, where they have definitely tied in the, um, the toxic air breathed in uh, with the illnesses that, that uh, people are, um, are uh, suffering from now. And besides the $90 million that she secured, and the 125 additional in funding that she had put back into into um, the budget that had been um, taken out on uh, September 13th, I think was this week, Wednesday, uh, before the Senate, she um, has a new proposal to provide 1.9 million in medical and mental health monitoring and treatment grants available from 2007 to 2011 to firefighters, police officers, EMTs, um, paramedics, building and construction, trade workers, volunteers, residents, and others whose health was directly impacted at Grand Zero and Fresh Hills. This funding would be administrated through the Centers uh, for Disease Control and Prevention and would expand access to health monitoring and health care to all of those who served, lived, and worked in the area in the aftermath of 9-11. So we go from there. Thank you all. You still hear the, the squealing of the iron. I can hear the rumbling of the first tower coming down. So being an iron worker and being a person in the construction field where every day you face some type of hazard, some type of danger, well, right after we witnessed that collapse, we knew that we wanted to, uh, to go into the trade center site. Meanwhile, everybody else is running from it. And here you got a bunch of guys, your first responders that are looking to go in. We would have been better off if the PA had said nothing at all. Because if EPA had said nothing at all, People would have used their common sense. They would have said, looks bad, smells bad, probably shouldn't be it. But EPA said, it's fine, it's safe, we've tested, comes back. And everybody came back. And thousands and thousands of people were exposed. The smell of death. You know, things that we remember that you really don't want to remember. Here was the worst toxic waste site ever, and no one in government did a thing to protect the hundreds of thousands of people who were there. We've been abandoned by local, state, federal government. <laughs> Forezzo. I was a union structural line worker with Local 361, and uh, I had been a construction worker, an iron worker, for almost 25 years, both outside local and inside locals. And I helped build a lot of uh, New York City skyline, but I was there somewhere between 29 to 32 days. And my first four days, sometimes we were there around the clock. We weren't getting paid, we were there as volunteers, utilizing our capacity as iron workers to cut up debris, such as the enormous iron beams and columns, all the massive structures that were still there. Dr. Leonardo Trisande, my friend, my dear friend, currently serves as the Assistant Director for the Mount Sinai Center for Children's Health and the Environment. CCHE is the nation's first academic research and policy center to examine the links between the exposure to toxic pollutants and childhood illness. Remember, we are most vulnerable 
in the womb and during our developing years. So this is all about all of us. Dr. Rasande earned a master's degree in public policy from Harvard Kennedy School of Government and as an MD from Harvard Medical School. He completed a pediatric residency at Boston Children's Hospital. After his residency, Dr. Rasande served as a Dyson Fellow Advocacy Fellow to Hillary Rodham Clinton, advising the First Lady on environmental and child health issues. A star in our eyes, Leo. Thank you for coming. I'll skip over. Hugh's not in yet. He said to start. Okay, so Kenneth Cook. <coughs> Kenneth Cook, B A B S M S. Um, also in the environmental movement. We've all heard of Kenneth Cook. Today I'm privileged for the second time to see you. And I was looking forward to hearing your remarks today. He is presently a senior poly, he is a, a university from, he has his BA, BS, and MS from the University of Missouri in Columbia. President and co founder of a very highly recognized environmental working group. Um, and he was a board member of Environmental Media Services, former vice president for the Center for Resource and Economics, former former press director for the World Wildlife Fund. He is recognized as one of the most influential agricultural leaders of the 20th and 21st century. Your remarks will be pointed today. I'm looking forward to it. John, thank you so much for coming. It's the first time that we've met personally. John is the president and co-founder of Unsung Heroes Helping Heroes. Mr. Spirazzo, is a member of the Union Iron Workers, the Local 361, and heroic first responder. He worked tirelessly for over 30 days at Ground Zero and became disabled shortly after the attack. Having met with many other first responders, he founded this organization with others to aid and assist the victims of 9-11. Advocate for responders' rights and gain long-term medical coverage for all of our heroes. Married to a wonderful woman, they have two daughters and an 18-year-old son who joined the Air Force in August. That's what we live for, right? Our kids. Marvin Bethea, Vice President and Co-Founder of Unsung Heroes Helping Heroes. Marvin, a paramedic, was buried in debris two times on September 11th while escorting victims to safety. He returned to provide more aid on September 14th. Five weeks later, he suffered a stroke attributed to 9-11 stress and later was diagnosed with adult onset asthma, post-traumatic stress disorder, and chronic rhinitis. Um, is it true that you were not awarded workers' compensation until 2006? Uh, about the July this year. Unheard of. <coughs> Bonnie Geefried, a board member for Unsuck Heroes Helping Heroes. Thank you for coming. Really appreciate it. Your words were also very remarkable. You have a bachelor's degree in social work and is a former EMT at Flushing Hospital Medical Center. Born into a family of community-minded activists, you became a volunteer firefighter and have dedicated your life to helping physically and mentally challenged. Shortly after 9-11, you were diagnosed with asthma, damaged vocal cords, post-traumatic stress disorder, and had a wrist surgically reconstructed as a result of being buried alive. That's the right. last year, you were ordained as an interfaith minister. Allison Johnson, um, we met in, both in, uh, in Baltimore in June, and uh, were best partners last night. <laughs> Allison stayed over. over at my house. Quite an extraordinary woman. Allison has a BA, MA, is a summa cum laude graduate at Carlton College. You produced and directed documentaries titled Multiple Chemical Sensitivity, How Chemical Sensitivity Exposures May Be Affecting Your Health, Gulf War Syndrome, The Aftermath of a Toxic Battlefield, and now Toxic Clouds of 9-11, A Looming Health Disaster, and it is. She has also edited a book titled Casualties of Progress, 
personal histories from the chemically sensitive and has written a book titled Gulf War Syndrome, Legacy of a Perfect War. She's currently finishing a book on multiple chemical sensitivity that will contain chapters on the health problems affecting workers who help clean up the Exxon Valdez oil spill. I heard about that last night. The soldiers who developed Gulf War Syndrome in the 1999-1991 war and the New Yorkers exposed to the toxins released by the WTC collapse and subsequent fires. I'd like, yeah, and Hugh is gathering up his papers. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Hugh Kaufman and then he'll just come on in. Hugh? Joel. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Joel Kaufman. Um, I had met Joel and he is an attorney. Um, he has been depicted uh, in the film as pushing the envelope forward on the exposures as fiberglass and dioxin, gathering up information and helping to push our political envelope. Because beyond having victims, it's really important to have an advocate out there that's gathering up the, in the information so that these first responders and others can get the help that they <coughs> need. Thank you so very much for coming. Hugh Kaufman is presently a senior policy analyst for the Office of Solid Waste and Emergency Response. With 35 years experience at the EPA, he's still there in Washington, Mr. Kaufman, as you saw in the film, was the EPA consultant for New Orleans during the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Mr. Kaufman formerly served as chief investigator for the EPA National Ombudsman. Um, Hugh called uh, Allison and I up. Um, late last night, early this morning, to say that he's decided that in his spending he was going to bring forward some smoking gun documentation that will drive this issue forward. It is really important that the people here in this room gather up all their resources and think not only, oh, woe is you and woe is me, but work together to get policymakers to address this issue because moving forward we have to have government watch our backs they take enough of our tax dollars and put it in epa and fda names but they're not watching our back so it actually takes a collective to spur action so i'd like to ask uh leo dr Trisande, to begin and Leo and I um, work on children's health, so I think Leo has the capability to tie in the vulnerability of human beings and occupational health and the World Trade Center. Leo, thank you. Thank you, Karen. It's an honor to be here. This film is ultimately about 9-11 and the health effects of the workers who so selflessly expose themselves to a wide array of toxic slew of is this coming? Is it being broken? Okay. Wow, oh, that needs to be louder. Okay. Uh, perhaps the feedback's not coming up that well. Um, and ultimately, I, uh, I I wish my colleagues uh, Robert Herbert and Steve Lynn could, could be here today. Uh, they work most directly on the, the health effects of the workers who were exposed uh, to the toxic slew that resulted from 9-11. Uh, but I can communicate uh, on their behalf the, the wide array of, of health effects that endure in, in, in workers and in, in the volunteers who, who, who selflessly gave their time and energy. Uh, to the cleanup and to so many other activities that were going around 9-11. And I'll allow uh, my colleagues on the panel to speak directly to, to those health effects. But what I feel I could offer uh, today is, is my perspective as a pediatrician uh, to a silent 9-11, if you will, that is happening, happening each day, each year. Uh, and that is uh, a similar uh, toxic slew that is affecting hundreds of thousands of children each year. Um, we face currently an epidemic of, of chronic disease, currently asthma, childhood 
cancer, birth defects, and some developmental disabilities are all on the rise. And increasingly, environmental links to those diseases are being found each day. It's not just lead, uh, mercury, pesticides, it's polychlorinated bipedals, uh, polybrominated diethyl ethers, chemicals with a very long name, many of them uh, have, were found in the toxic slew around 9-11. Um, why don't we hear about this uh, devastating um, disaster in the news? Why don't we hear about this each day? Why don't we witness this in the, in the same uh, blunt way that was described in this film? Well, there are a few reasons for that. One is that the effects of these chemical exposures of this toxic injury are subtle. They're not uh, things that uh, you see uh, obviously. It's an IQ point here and there. It's a subtle inability to learn and maybe a birth defect that can be otherwise explained away as a result of genetic predisposition or what have you. Often the chemical exposure is gone by the time the health effect is present. Uh, you can't, for example, go back and determine if mercury exposure caused the child to lose IQ points as a result of exposure during the prenatal period because mercury is gone from the body in about 30 to 60 days. Similar things happen for pesticides, PCBs, and a wide array of other chemicals that are known to be toxic to children. And uh, finally, we don't know much at all about the toxicity of, of, of chemicals. It's amazing uh, that we know what we know uh, about asbestos, about lead, about PCBs and pesticides. There's some 80,000 chemicals widely used in the United States today, accepted for use by the EPA. Uh, there are 2,000 that we call uh, high production volume chemicals, or HPV chemicals. Those chemicals are used uh, in millions of tons each year at minimum. Of those 2,000, maybe 3,000 chemicals, fewer than half have any toxicity testing data at all. Uh, we're not talking about the, the, the cream of the crop, the asbestos for which Herman Solikoff and others at, at Mount Sinai really studied carefully. It's scary what we don't know. And when you get down to effects on children, we know something about fewer than one fifth, maybe 7% of those chemicals. So it's amazing what we don't know. And unfortunately, we have to use incidents like 9-11 to bring forth the, the chronic disease epidemic, the environmental disaster that's happening under our noses uh, each day in America today. And I hope that we can take that opportunity to draw, uh, this opportunity to draw some attention to this issue, which is so important. Um, I'd like to close my comments with two promising opportunities uh, two steps that we can take as a group and as a, a state and a county and as a nation uh, to do something about this epidemic. Uh, one is that there is hope for understanding and locking the links between environmental hazards and illnesses in children. And that's a national children's study that uh, if federal funding moves forward for it, uh, will actually take place here in, in I'm right, we're in Nassau County. It is, my apologies. <laughs> Next door in Nassau County. I apologize. I'm a little bit ignorant about my counties. I wish I, I knew better. I apologize. I'm a Manhattanite. Sorry. <laughs> but we'll have it right next door in Nassau County. It will start in Queens. So both are not uh, far from here at all. But it's a study of 100,000 children looking at chemicals and other factors in child development and trying to establish those links. Ideally, we have data on toxicity of environmental chemicals. I'm sure Ken will comment about the devastating lack of data that we have when it comes to understanding it. So imagine how hard it is for an internist, a pediatrician, to, to help advise a family about chemical exposures. Not to mention the fact that we get so little training when it comes to the health effects of toxic chemicals. We get taught a lot more about viruses and bacteria and muscle, uh, muscle connections, but we don't learn much about occupational environmental medicine. But the National Children's Study was actually, it was funded by Congress five years ago, established by Congress five years ago, was ready to go into the field, but, and the current administration decided to cut funding out altogether and stop, and actually mandated the study stop. 
Well, fortunately, we've got a lot of supporters in Congress, but we need your help to push this through. The preliminary legislation that provides funds for fiscal year 2007 suggests that the study will actually go forward, but there's still a chance that it will not. And uh, our hope is that with your help, we can get that national shelf study going forward. So it's going to take some time, 25 years of, of study to look at uh, children, exposures from before birth, all the way up to age 25. But we'll learn things very early on in the first couple of years of the study that will help us prevent another 9-11 from happening in our children each day. One final comment that hits closer to home. Um, here on, on Long Island and across the state, we're pushing very hard to establish a system of environmental clinics. Those environmental clinics were so occupational clinics for adults, were so critical. There was a network established back in the early, in the late 1980s that allowed us to be so effective at Mount Sinai in engaging the response and identifying the diseases that occurred in workers after 9-11. That was because a statewide occupational network of clinics was established through the state with the help of, of unions, of health professionals, of Dr. Irving Selikoff and his colleagues. And that set the groundwork for the response we were able to get in 9-11. If we didn't have those clinics, I don't think we'd be here today talking about the health effects. We'd be talking about a big mystery. And going back to the analogy that we're facing with children today, uh, with the, the chronic disease epidemic that we can unlock uh, without more knowledge. We need a similar network of children's environmental health clinics in New York State. And we're working with our colleagues in the State Assembly, led by Tom DiNapoli and Dick Gottfried, who've been fierce advocates on this behalf. And we're, we've finally gotten some seed money to start those clinics, but we need continued support uh, from our colleagues in, in, in Albany to get that done. That system of children's environmental health clinics would do the same things that the occupational net network was so critical in doing. Diagnosing uh, children with diseases of environmental origin, but also, most importantly, preventing those diseases and educating doctors about diseases and environmental exposures when they occur. I apologize for the long-winded comments, but I thought I would provide in a, a different perspective and perhaps something that we can use uh, as an opportunity. I think this film is an opportunity for them to take the unfortunate disaster that happened to the workers, the second wave of, of affected people, and use that to do something good in the future to prevent another 9-11. Uh, ten samples we found 
after looking for over 400 chemicals, a total of 287 in these samples. The average of 10 individuals was 200 toxic chemicals. These were chemicals like mercury, uh, brominated flame retardants, PCBs that we had banned decades ago, organochlorine pesticides that we had banned decades ago, chemicals that are used to, to treat carpets and fabrics and clothing to repel stains, chemicals like the Teflon chemicals, uh, like Scotchgard. These were all in these samples in combination. Multiple carcinogens, <coughs> multiple neurotoxins, multiple agents that can cause birth defects or immune system disorders. Many of them were at very low levels, but we found an extraordinary number. This was after spending $10,000 per sample. If we had spent fifteen dollars or $20,000, we would have found many more. Now, the one thing I'll observe about the people who participated in this study is that these were samples of umbilical cord blood. These were exposures that babies experienced in the womb before they were born. They were born, all we know about them, sometime between August and September of 2004. No one except a, a, a little nonprofit organization had ever bothered to look and see if in fact the placenta was, as many people have thought for years, you might naturally think, served to filter some of these toxic chemicals and protect babies in the womb. These chemicals, and many more that we couldn't afford to study, were coursing through these babies basically from the time they were conceived. So you come into the world polluted with industrial chemicals. It begins in the womb. Now, you hear a lot of skepticism about low levels of toxic chemicals. You hear, I'm sure you have heard, skepticism about your illnesses, your symptoms. Uh, one minute you're a hero and healthy and, and working overtime, and the next minute, uh, well, maybe they're uh, a little crazy, maybe they're a little lazy, maybe they're looking for a fast buck, or you've sure made a fortune out of this, haven't you? <laughs> That's what we've done. Well, on a, in, a, in a way, we do that on all these issues. There's a powerful set of industries uh, making products we all rely on, and we all use, and we all value that are produced with chemicals and contain chemicals and other toxic elements that are harming us in ways we've not studied. And, uh, the good doctor has explained just some of that. Cosmetic ingredients that you are allergic to, react to strongly now. Uh, several of, of the folks on this panel, I'm sure many of you out there, cosmetics are uh, not, there's no requirement for testing the ingredients before they're approved on the marketplace. FDA does no studies of them whatsoever. That's the agency in charge. It's regulated by the industry itself. Uh, industrial chemicals that are uh, brought into <coughs> commerce. Uh, we approve uh, thousands of them each year, new ones. Uh, the average time for approval is about eight weeks. There are no required studies before they come onto the market, no matter what the quantity used or how intimately we're exposed to them. This safety net is broken. And the official curiosity about it, just like Hugh says, the official curiosity about what happened at 9-11 and after Katrina and after many other episodes that he studied and we have too, the official curiosity is pretty low. And the reason is economic. They don't want to know. They don't want to lift up those rocks and find out what's underneath them. We have to fix that. Now, I always end the talk like this, especially a brief one, uh, by, by reminding people that low doses can be, in, in fact, quite potent. I'm sure you've all seen the advertisement for Cialis on television. <laughs> the guys are looking out at the air right now. <laughs> well, when you administer a, a dose, take a dose of Cialis uh, for erectile dysfunction, they, they tell you on the label that 30 hours later, the level in your blood will be 30 parts per billion. Far lower than many of the levels of the chemicals in the tests we did of babies. And that's just one compound. And of course, if you're taking it for the intended effect, we hope it works. We hope this drug is therapeutic. But listen the next time to the side effects at 30 parts per billion. Just listen to that. 
Now, I don't know how you're supposed to call your medical doctor and tell him you've had an erection for more than four hours, as they tell you to do. That's the side effect. That's one of the side effects. That's possible, because we're all different. Has anyone tried to call their doctor? <laughs> We're all different. We're all exquisitely put together by a plan we don't understand. And we're all different in how we react to these chemicals. And there are some people who take that chemical, that, that drug for good reason, and have to be warned on television about that side effect. Imagine all the chemicals and drugs we take in combination that have never been studied to understand what the impacts are. And you tell me that these folks who've had these ser serious illnesses, changes in their lives, changes in their economic prospects, uh, changes in their everyday relationships, their ability to live. You tell me that we don't owe it to them to investigate as aggressively as we can to help them and fix this safety net that allows not just cat catastrophic instances like we saw in 9-11, saw in the Pentagon with the incredible exposures that everyone experienced. But as the good doctor says, that also happens to us every day, slowly but surely, just by living. That ain't right. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'm sorry I was outside uh, with some reporters going through some of the issues. Uh, everything that's been said and uh, we've heard over and over uh, are quite substantial. Uh, I was one of the people who helped start EPA 36 years ago uh, when I was a youngster. Uh, before that, I was a, an officer in the United States Air Force for four years during the Vietnam War. Uh, but one of the things that I think we have to deal with before we can get a grapple get a grip, okay, before we can actually get a grip on solving these problems and preventing these problems is to fix a broken government. Our government's broken right now as it relates to environmental and public health. Information is just beginning to come out right now that top government officials including the administrator of EPA, Christy Todd Whitman at the time, produced false information, false assurances to the public uh, about the safety, both for the heroes, the responders, and the people who were brought back to their homes and jobs in lower Manhattan after the World Trade Center attack when the air was not safe. Uh, internal documents, both in the city and EPA, document the fact that the air was not safe. On top of that, uh, I performed an investigation when I was chief investigator for EPA's ombudsman at the request of Congressman Nadler to uh, evaluate the responses to the environmental damages by EPA uh, beginning in January of 2002. That's when we started our investigation. We found we had two 12-hour hearings. Uh, one thing we found both in, in reviewing documents, interviewing people, and holding the hearings is that the heroes, the responders, most of them were given paper masks. Even though the paper mask said this will not protect your lungs, right on the mask. On top of that, people were told not to wear respirators and protective equipment because they didn't wear, want to scare the government, scare the public. So the government didn't want the public scared so they didn't want people wearing respirators, even though everybody knows that you needed protection to be on that pile or at that site. Even the President of the United States went on that site without a respirator to give the impression that it was safe, and it wasn't safe. Now, Christy Todd Whitman has claimed that, that Mayor Giuliani is responsible and had responsibility for the site. In fact, Presidential Decision Directive 62 mandates that EPA has responsibility uh, for remediation and cleanup at terrorism uh, sites such as 9-11. Such as and she testified to Congress as such. Uh, notwithstanding that, she's blamed everything on, 
uh, on, on Giuliani. Well, I can tell you that Mayor Giuliani, and I'm, I'm not a Republican or a Democrat, I'm an independent, I try to stay out of this. Mayor Giuliani was not responsible for the President of the United States not wearing a respirator at Ground Zero. He has no authority over the President of the United States. That's a federal matter. So, so what, what do we have going on? We have buck passing and the public not being protected. Both the, the heroes who worked on the pile and the people who were sent back home to save the insurance company's money when the internal documents show that the city knew and recommended not letting the people come back uh, early because the air was not safe. And you've seen, I'm sure, some of the press accounts of those internal documents recently. Unfortunately, the uh, uh, government, the president, did not um, uh, try to use his authority to abolish the uh, safety and health and environmental regulations. And so there are billions of dollars of lawsuits now by residents and by the heroes uh, to get their health taken care of down the line and make sure they're safe. Uh, the first responders to me are like the, have been treated like the canaries in a mine site. They're the first ones to get sick. But the concern also is the residents and the school children who were brought back and the workers in the area when the air wasn't safe. That's going to be the next line of people who are going to get sick down the line. And, and uh, we need to uh, provide all those folks uh, uh, health protection. Not count the dead bodies in surveys, but health protection, health care down the line for, uh, for the problems they have today, the problems they'll, and the problems they'll experience in the future. When Katrina hit, we had a similar situation. A lot of toxics down there, a lot of oil, a lot of chemicals, benzene, lead, arsenic, uh, uh, as well as uh, bacteria and viruses that, that uh, would affect anyone who was wading through that water when it's there and in remediating uh, many areas like St. Bernard's Parish. Well, this time the government learned its lesson. So the president, by declaration, abolished the environmental, occupational safety and health laws. So consequently, you have volunteers from faith-based organizations, volunteer organizations going down and doing the remediation without adequate protection. It would be the same as if you sent faith-based or organizations to war without adequate uh, protection to fight a war. There are hot spots of areas that people who are not certified with proper protection should not go in, should not do remediation. And yet in newspapers all over the country, you see children, college kids, wearing paper masks, doing remediation and cleanup work in St. Bernard's Parish that has high levels of benzene, lead, arsenic, mold, etc. in the air. And if you read the box that those paper masks come in, it's the N95 paper mask, it says, this will not protect you from anything but dust. Do not use it if there are toxins. On top of that now, one of the biggest concerns, and, and, and uh, the uh, chief, both chief commissioners of the 9-11 report, uh, Mr. Keene, former governor of New Jersey, and Mr. Hamilton, a former senior congressman, have both said their biggest concern for the United States in a terrorist attack is if someone unleashes a dirty bomb in New York or Washington or Chicago or anywhere. That's their biggest concern. So you know how the administration has handled that? They've changed the rules and they took the safety levels for radionuclides and they weakened them so that if a dirty bomb goes off in New York, to determine the cleanup levels, you take into account the economics of the area and tourism to reduce the protections for rate from radionuclides so you can get things back to normal. Really. This is a, these are examples of, of, of how the government is broken and has to be fixed if we are to protect ourselves, not just from small concentrations of industrial waste that was found in the centers of newborn babies, 
but high concentrations of toxic materials after a terrorist attack or after a national emergency like Katrina. Until we fix the broken government, none of us is safe. Thank you very much. I'm Joel Kaufman. I want to thank Aaron and Laura. I also want to thank Vic and Charlotte. I spent many a year in this theater, and I think half of my environmental education came from watching a lot of the movies here. Whitman's deliberate and misleading statements made to the press when she reassured the public that the air was safe to breathe around Lower Manhattan and Brooklyn, and that there would be no health risk presented to those returning to those areas shots the conjure. This is the words, not of Duke Hoffman, Joel Hoffman, this is the words of Judge Batts in the decision, um, a case called Benzman versus Whitman and the EPA, that I'm proud to be a co-counsel on, basically charging Whitman for lying to the public. Um, but I think th this, there's been a victory in this decision, now it's in the Court of Appeals, and now three congressmen have called for criminal charges against Christy Todd Whitman. And i got to say something, and this is actually a public admission, I feel a little guilty that in some ways that all this action is focusing on Whitman. She's becoming a scapegoat. She's damn guilty. She's damn guilty, and I'll, and I'll go into it like two, three minutes to explain why she's been guilty. But also you have a mayor, okay, that was there, that he told, through his other work, through his, through his subordinates, to HPD inspectors, people who had to go out and check all the housing in the residential areas down there not to wear a mask. We have the health department who told their own workers not to wear a mask. We have judges in Lower Manhattan that approached myself at these hearings and saying, can we hire you? We're scared to go onto that bench, but they won't let us go back without wearing a mask. And so the question is, I think we have to look, what happened in those first two, three weeks that happened? There's a lot of studies out there. There's a lot of millions of dollars going on applying for studies. And I think a lot of that money is going to the wrong people. It's going to science groups, scientists that were silent the first few weeks, that didn't say anything. Samples were actually gathered. I got, a, I, I got an email from the Raleigh Observer, from the, the deputy head of NIHS, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, and he said, I'm going to put together a list of 200 toxic chemicals at the World Trade Center, and I'm sending in people from NYU to collect them, and we're going to analyze them. And I said, this is great. Finally, someone is, is, is speaking, and someone from the government is coming out. I, mean, I didn't hear anything. I kept on checking Google over and over again, pushing that button, until I finally got through to Raleigh, and they said, through the budget and priority changes, we're no longer checking out those samples. So much for the samples that were collected. Those samples appeared two weeks ago in a study that was done by NYU by scientists that are saying now that things aren't that bad. And they got, I don't know how many thousands of dollars to analyze those samples and say they were bad, not so bad, or whatever. So like I said before, the question is, where were these people from the beginning? We're in Suffolk County, and part of my experience in this whole case begins in Suffolk County. This is the county that was very fortunate to New York City, when the first West Nile virus um, mosquito appeared, they decided to send a few hundred gallons or 20 gallons of malathion to the city as a gift. Okay. I knew, being a resident of Suffolk County before, that that came from an unheated warehouse right in the outside. Malathion, when it becomes really, really hot, becomes maloxone, and that's malathion, which is even more dangerous than malathion. And what did they do? That gift back to Suffolk County? came to New York, they sprayed the streets of Harlem. Not just mosquitoes, but they sprayed the people of New York. Okay, when we found the mayor's anti-terrorist handbook on page 55, it said, Malathion is a chemical that terrorists like to use to terrorize. It took the city 24 hours to answer, Mr. Kupferman, that's a different type. Okay, we knew the fix was in before 9-11. The spraying continued. They went to Spray Central Park, and they get a call from a cop. And this cop is one of the, the untold heroes. His name is, is, is um, Tom Barnett. And he said, Joel, I heard you on the radio about the, the problems with the pesticides. Why are we cops lined up in short sleeve shirts to be sprayed when we're keeping all the civilians out? And what did he, you know, he said, what could you do? My guys are really scared. And they said, get me down there. 
and he did. He got me down there, and I saw the city of New York, the Department of Health contractors, go up and down spraying, including our men in blue. And he said, trust him, tr you know, tr Joel, Joel's trustable, he's one of us, tr well, I don't know about that, but when you can have the National Lawyers Guild, a lot of cops wouldn't say that. But he said, talk to them, Joel. And what I did is I said, whatever you do, don't take your clothes home when you have yeah, to, your, to, your, to your families. Whatever is going to happen to you, you should wash, your, you know, wash it off, but don't take your, 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 your clothes home. And they said, thank you. No one ever told us that. Four weeks later, the towers fall at 9-11. About three days after that, I get a call from Thomas Barnett. And he said, Joel, you got to help me again. My guys are spitting up dust and they're spitting up blood. You have to do something. And I said, what did you do before? And he said, get me down there. And he did. I'm not supposed to really admit this to anyone in public, but someone that looked like me ended up there two days later in a blue shirt and blue hat. And what I did is I just grabbed samples. Very expensive methods. Methods that the EPA, DEP, and the city said they don't have enough money to spend sampling. I took a plastic bag and I took a plastic spoon. And what I did is I gathered up the samples. I didn't have to be a rocket scientist because it looked like hay in Kansas after a dust storm. I just gathered the stuff, and I took it, and I sent it to two, two labs. One lab that the city used, because I knew they were going to attack my veracity and the, the veracity of the lab. And the same lab of a guy named Bob Simon in Virginia, who grew up on Long Island and was one of the best witnesses against the spray. We, have, we all, even people in Suffolk County, owe a lot of gratitude to. And would we find we found 5% asbestos and 90% fiberglass. I took 12 samples, 10 to 12 samples, and over half had over 1%. The EPA took hundreds and found very little. We have a little bit of a different track record here. Um, I'm out to be hired to find your asbestos. Okay. Um, and also we kept on hearing from, from the, uh, all the radio that the air was safe, but they did do a citation. They said, we're looking at New York State air monitoring reports. And they kept on saying it over and over again. And what did we do? As a lawyer, as someone that's a little interested, what I did is I did a Freedom of Information quest. It looks exactly like this. And I sent one to the feds, one to the city, one to the state. The state, and one of the, the bad guys here, whose name keeps on getting unmentioned over and over again, is Governor Pataki. And I'd like to say that he, to me, is one of the worst culprits. And we got, and people in Suffolk County, Nassau, and New York City have to exert pressure on our state legislators and ask, where the hell, excuse my French, were they, where has the state been? And one of those smoking <coughs> documents, a little digression, we learned that the DEC police was at the World Trade Center site, but two, three weeks after 9 11, miraculously they were just pulled. That's one of the questions you might want to go ask the state senator, the state assemblyman. Where was the DEC police? So we foiled, and the, what the state told us, that due to ongoing criminal investigation, we can't give you these records. Okay, what ongoing criminal investigation, we ask? And not only that, I found out from the DEC attorneys down here that it wasn't their decision, it was people in Albany. It was the lawyers, the top lawyers in Albany, and the governor that made that decision. So here we are, we're being told by people in Albany, and people in Washington, that it's okay. We're being told by people that it's not raining, that never look out the window. We're looking out, we see rain coming down. The city responded, and they, they were a little faster. But lo and behold, they didn't give us all the records that they had, because the state ended up giving us more. What the city gave us was records that said the monitors, originally on their, on their, on their website, said ND, no detect. And to me, that meant no detect means no problem, right? No detect meant clogged meant that the filters were so clogged with dust that they couldn't even measure it. But they just told us, no detect. And one of those monitors was in Ms. Bendick's office, which happens to be down the hall from May Giuliani, because she was his assistant chief of staff. The law project were the ones who told the employees at City Hall, including the chief of security, that this dust was found there. No one from the city bothered to tell their own staff. The state eventually gives us the information, but the feds gave us that information also. In that 800 pages of documents that we got from the EPA, it said that there was a problem, that some of the monitors were clogged, that there were high levels of asbestos, 3%, 4%, 5%. We had benzene, we had dioxin, 
which is the most dangerous chemical known to man. So what did we do? The law project sought help. And we did is we contacted an industrial hygienist named Venona Russell, who is, is probably one of the few industrial hygienists in all of New York City post 9-11 that had a little bit of backbone. Okay? We sat down and wrote an advisory that told all the workers down there, beware, do not take your clothes home. We got problems with benzene, asbestos, everything that was listed. And we handed it out. We handed out thousands of them. Now you look at the media, and the media is saying, no one told anybody anything. We just listened to Christy Todd with them. One of the culprits here is the media. Okay? We were, it was the New York Times. Okay? The New York Times not only did not report in their home section, this isn't reporting, this isn't called um, news bulletin releases, but they just covered other stuff. In their own home section, they told the public you can go home and wipe your, 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 your apartments with a wet rag and cloth. And the picture that they showed, if people recall, you could see the dust on people's on, on, people, on, that, on that picture, how thick the dust was. You can almost write on it. I guess, there goes my subscription to New York Times. <laughs> the law project has been mentioned like hundreds and hundreds of times out there by the media and listed twice by the New York Times. Once was in a letter that we wrote that slipped in, and the other was another article. So we have to ask, where was the media? Okay? We took the data that we found in the EPA documents and at 5%, we gave it to Juan Gonzalez in the Daily News. And Juan, we got to know Juan a little spring issue. He, we made the front page with Steed and Nightmare because the workers that the city hired were not given masks and they got ill. The story that's going to slowly and surely repeat itself. And Juan ended up on the front page with a story called Toxic Nightmare. <coughs> that basically, I think, was the breaking story. And Newsday did some good coverage also. But what, what, what you don't hear in the Daily News now, and they're very proud that they, they covered this story and had Juan there, is that Juan's immediate editor was, was, was transferred. So putting that story in, because the owner and the head editors were out on vacation, when they came back, they said, what the hell is this? Because they succumbed to a lot of pressure from City Hall. So we have to really look at where's all this pressure coming from. And then what did we do? We started taking more samples, we got the word out, and eventually got a call from the UFA, the Uniform Firefighters Association. And they said, Joel, you are confirming to local project, we want to hire you. And basically, you're the only ones that are telling us what's out there, and we're really concerned. And one of the reasons why we're concerned is that the firefighters who were down there getting upset, not so much with what was down there, but the conditions that they were sent back to. And what they did is they complained that they'd go out in the fire truck, hit a bump, and all of a sudden, dust would just come back from the, from the top of their truck. It wasn't just to trucks that were down at 9-11. It was trucks that were decontaminated. Decontaminated by companies hired by the city of New York to find all this dust. And then we actually got an excuse, the same people who told us that Malathion is a different type, that these companies didn't know all the compartments in the fire trucks. Okay? We got even more scared. And the fire department, the fire, not the fire department, but the fire union said, please you know, start checking out these trucks. And we did. And how we found out that the problem was bigger than we thought originally is that they took the hoses off the backs of the truck that were contaminated, put them on the floor of the firehouse, right next to the kitchen areas, right next to all those firefighter heroes that the mayor and the president put their arms around. And we, they took the trucks out, supposedly decontaminated, and brought it back, put the, the contaminated hoses back onto the trucks, okay? We checked, we found contamination in the trucks and back and in the floors. Then they said, Mr. Kupferman, we don't know where this, where this, where this um, asbestos comes from. OSHA standards require, and they became experts on defending which tests to use, asbestos has to be airborne, okay? And in order to do a, 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 a true OSHA test, which is, <coughs> they get us the full submission, it's going to be yet more. So what did they do? They took the drivers of the fire trucks out and sent them out again with the vents fully open, hitting curb to curb without a mask to, to try to measure the, the, the asbestos. And what did they do also? We found the asbestos. They said it might have been from somewhere else. Ladder 25 on West 77th Street was one of the trucks that we hired to examine. We pulled the, the ladder out from the back of the truck. And what do we find? We find an envelope wrapped around the truck. 
and it said, Port Authority, Milton Patcher, General Counsel, One World Trade Center. We find an envelope from the World Trade Center wrapped around this different relic. This is the same fire department that said, we don't know where the asbestos is from. We don't know where this fire is from. And also we learned from the firefighters, at the same time the EPA said, we don't know how far this plume is going. And the last official word is they're still looking at the maps. They also told us at the beginning that the boundary was, was, was Chamber Street. As if these molecules coming from the World Trade Center came up to Chamber Street and just actually dropped. <laughs> they listened to May Giuliani, something that I had trouble doing, but these molecules did. One of the firefighters corrected me, and unfortunately he's from a firehouse called the Cancer House in Red Hook, Brooklyn. And he said, Mr. Kufferman, the dust didn't just go over the East River, it went under. And I looked puzzled and he said, it was trucked through, through Brooklyn, on the way to Fresh Air. And two of us had to come out twice to put out fires on the trucks that were carrying the debris through Brooklyn on the way to Staten Island. So for Christy Todd Whitman, the Mayor Giuliani, and everyone else that's in CDC, another agency, to tell us that they're still looking at Brooklyn, and they didn't know what to Brooklyn, is totally false. No microscope, no telescope do we need. We just know the trucks went through there. Okay? On the film, we saw Jenna was here, explained to us that the barge was dangerous to the students of Stuyvesant because the trucks went by. I'm saying that the trucks went by, not just through there, they kept on going to Brooklyn and all the way to Staten Island. And then we did, and I'm gonna, I don't want to take up too much time, I can speak for hours and hours. What we also did is that we wanted EPA, there were some good people in EPA, in some ways I'm one of the best defenders of EPA, and probably one of the few people out there that if you're asking for an increase in their budget, not a decrease. And that's what the president's been announcing less than three days ago. He announced he wants to decimate, decimate the EPA. We'll close the libraries and laboratories. What we did is that one of the tenants of a building that's a few blocks north of Chamber Street, on, on Franklin Street, if you, people are familiar with Manhattan, a block away from my office, he said, Joel, please help. They want to do is they want to cut a hole in my ceiling in my building and put up a, 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 a stairway up, but I'm concerned about all the debris that's up there. <coughs> Besides, there's a daycare center in my building, okay? And the kids are going up and down an elevator, and it's an old loft building, and they can touch the debris that's on the ledge, and there's broken windows. So what did I do? We kept on calling up all these IHs, industrial hygienists, no, no one is around, and she was concerned about the kids and the safety of the workers that were doing the cleanup. And we grabbed samples and came up with 2.6% um, asbestos which is two and a half times more than the 1% cutoff level and fiberglass. And we approached the EPA, and the play the last one good guy in the EPA that was still listening to us was the guy that helped us on the pesticide case. When he listened to us on the pesticide case, he sent the state in, the state gave a million dollar fine against that spray company. So we said, Joel, we owe the law project something because you brought us all this money, you know, for this fine. And he sent, it's the first time they sent the EPA asbestos investigator into a building. Fortunately, that day, the New York City shows up at the same time. They're DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, and they split the sample. It means the EPA guy suited up with a big suit, and after accusing my client of placing the debris on the roof, just like here, and she said, you're right, see all the debris on these other 50 buildings? I, last night, placed it all over, you know, that's those samples. Then, what they did, they split it with the city, Two days later, the city came up with NT, no detect, nothing, nada, okay? And they used something called PLM, polarized light microscopes. Low level tests, old method, a little antiquated, okay? It's basically using an old magnifying glass as opposed to a expensive magnifying glass or electronics. And I said, oh no, this is bad. I couldn't find a Dutch hygienist. They actually said, I, Joel, broke the law by taking these samples you know, without having, without having the right to grade. And I said, well, if I didn't take those samples, you guys would be here, and they agreed. And I said, I think I blew it. Three days later, I get a call in by um, Ms. Mears, who was the one who was basically Whitman's spokesperson in New York, for the EPA, was the one that repeated the statements, everything's okay, everything's okay, and also just go to the city health department pages, and they'll tell you that's okay also. They call me in, and in her office is the good EPA guy. He shows me a document, they have test results. They use TEM, trans-electronic microscopes, which is the higher, more expensive method. And what did they find? 
they found up to 5%. It's five times the cutoff level. Okay. A few, two weeks later, they announced the cleanup of Lowen New York. Not Chamber Street, but further up. What scares me today is people ask me, what lessons have we learned? We've learned that women is bad, that May is bad, they're pointing to each other, and they're not, they don't like each other, and you're never going to get them on sitting on the same day as together. We also know that the same people in the health department that made those decisions that day, most of them are still there. They're still using the same tests to tell us that the schools are okay, the hospitals are okay, and that the city offices are okay. So I think there's a burning question is, why are these people still in power? Why are they still allowed to be using the same low-level PLM? Why, with all the bad asbestos, millions of pounds that were down there, did the Department of Environmental Protection issue only one asbestos violation the whole time, okay? And I'll ask that because I want to get to John and Bonnie, Marvin and Allison, that we keep the remarks really short. I'll be sort of a taskmaster moving on because I think I could stay here all night, but maybe some of you cannot. Was there any kind of a health registry? And can we have one now? A health registry that the city uh, has advocated for, but there is also a clinic at Mount Sinai that if you're a worker or, or volunteer at the World Trade Center site, uh, that we desperately plead uh, you to come in and be evaluated. Um, the data that we have was only on a portion of the workers uh, that were down uh, on the pile. Uh, selflessly giving their time and, and, and bodies to 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 this task, and unfortunately, there's so many. I've gotten calls practically every day from hearing about stories that people have not come in to be evaluated. And one of the things you you hear in, in the press is, well, it, you selected only the ones who are the most affected. Well. We desperately plead people to come on in to, to Mount Sinai and, and to call at least and, and discuss and, and to seek advice, attention, for, and give themselves to the registry and to the other sources so that we can actually accurately count the people who are affected and sort the facts from the fear. I think we, I think we all agree that there's enough evidence to suggest that there is a link to this toxic dust and health effects that were experienced by these, by these brave people. But we need everybody who was affected to get the help that they deserve. I'd like to jump in real quick. First of all, I think it's very good to count the dead bodies, but I'm against just focusing attention on counting the dead bodies. I'm very much more interested in prevention in terms of making sure we don't have dead bodies and providing health care for folks who are getting sick. Right now, there is no program to provide the health care for these heroes to get sick. We've got two bills, maybe more. Uh, uh, certainly, Congressman Nadler has been with this issue since day one, September 11th. Uh, uh, Congressman Maloney has done a good job also. Uh, but we have to get health care for these people paid for, and not just the heroes, but also the people who, who were brought down and, and went to school. And I honestly believe to prevent down the line, there's a job that government has to do, which is to be honest and prevent. And the road to redemption, based on my experiences in the military, starts with incarceration. <laughs> you know, I just wanted to ask the, uh, especially the people who didn't get a chance to speak, what the one or two things they think should be done now. That's for the uh, guess remaining four people. Uh, to answer your question, uh, we feel the same way Mr. Kaufman does. We we definitely want to see accountability because what I'm scared of as the co-founder of the Unsung Heroes Helping Heroes, and, and this. Please try to understand that this is not some bunch of lunatics that just decided that they want to create something just to make fame. It has never ever been about the three of us here 
or the other two that are also involved, or, or all the members. What we are scared of is the word history. Does anybody know what I mean by the word history? In this particular instance, it happens to be an extremely repetitive thing. Whether you look at 9-11, which we've seen a production here today about 9-11. Whether it's about Katrina, whether it's about Wilma or Rita or any other man-made or natural disaster. Whether it involves just the responders, whether it involves the area residents, uh, the children. You know, what I'm really concerned with is bringing America back to its own boundaries. We're hiring politicians today who do not know what it means to think within the limits of the box. They think outside the box. And what is thinking outside the box? We're talking about global economy, world this, world that. Well, what did CAFTA do for Canada? What did NAFTA do for the United States? Let's consider all of this. It's about time we bring back those representatives or elect those representatives who represent American citizens. And if we don't have accountability to create the initial step to do this, well, you know what? We're all sitting here, and I can honestly look you all in the eyes, and we're, I can make this comment to you, we're going to hell in a handbasket. So if we don't take the advantage, and please, please do not mis understand what I'm saying here. I know 60-something percent of the United States does not favor George Bush. But in one aspect, we have to be thankful for an administration that has done so little for the American people because it has created the opportunity for so much change. Now let the unsung heroes and let all of us, let the panel here, let us all become opportunists. Let us take advantage of this opportunity so we can increase this, not for us, we know why. We were given shortened life sentences, but let us take advantage of this and create something that truly shows what red, white, and blue stands for. My son just joined the Air Force. What is his kids going to do? What are your children going to do? What are your grandchildren going to do? Do we let them become members of a third world nation? So ladies and gentlemen, if you get nothing else out of this, and if I can only instill one thing in you, then please, let us try to consider putting people in office that think inside the box. We gotta make sure that 9-11 does not become an afterthought. 
and that we we stay uh, to the presses, that we stay with the media, and we hold our elected officials responsible for this type of behavior. And if they can't do the job, we vote them in. Then you know it's time to vote them out. The people like me in politics, they like to have the responsibility to go to work with it also, and not to collect the people of this country. Um, what are we teaching our kids? You know, they say you pledge allegiance every day. Where's the justice for everybody? And justice for all? It's not for us. You know, we talk about the Constitution. Where's we the people? We're not we the people. You know, we are taught all these things in history, especially the bills of rights. Our rights have been violated left and right. And people really do not understand the humongous of course, this has not only to myself, to my family, to my partner. We've lost so much, but like we said, we are the voices of who died. We are the voices of everybody who's going to die. And it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. It's not only going to be civil servants, public servants, police, fire. You hear about police and fire a lot. But Marvin, and myself fall in a category where all these uh, happy laws that were just signed do not apply for us because we're not considered uniform workers. We are not considered civil servants and we are not considered public servant. In the meantime, here we are in the 911 system under the FIDNI participating agency. We go to the same academies, we get the same certificates, we do public servants but we're not perfect servants. Something to think about. It's a very, very complex picture. It's complex because we have a, a long history, I'm sorry to use the word history, John, but we have a long history in the United States of having government representation that doesn't represent the people, so Bobby said it well. Doesn't represent us. It's never been the case in the United States that we've had governments that have easily represented us. We've always had to fight. We've always had to fight. This is nothing new. So I think that the opportunity that 9-11 gives us on the backs of people who gave their honest daily work every day, going and coming every day to be there for the people of New York, to be there for the nation, is an opportunity to nail what's wrong with the system. And we don't always win when we do that. We try, I've been in this movement a very long time, environmental movement, for the people in the room were in organizations here know exactly who I am and how long I've been around. I've been quiet in the last few years, but I, I'm around. I'm there. And this is a, it's always a piecemeal by piecemeal issue, and it's always on the backs of people who suffer. Always on the backs of people who suffer. It's the brave people like you who come forward, but it's pushing the envelope and pushing the envelope and reinventing the wheel and creating the public approach and creating the public behind you and getting the press to come and over and over, nailing and hammering over and over. I think there are two elements here. One is the legitimate right of all workers who are exposed, the people who are exposed, to get what we the people deserve, what people need. And we cannot lose sight of that. That's a very important focus. The piece that spins off of it are the links and the connections to the other issues, that the way the government operates, and the long-term history of denial of people's needs around health, the public health system. Those are the two prongs, but if we pit them against each other, we won't win. If we align them against, with each other, the movement with each other, we cannot lose sight of what Joel is doing. Joel and, is using the legal system to represent we, us, the people, these people here too, it, and highlighting in very sharp focus what's wrong. That's an opportunity. And you know, it's interesting, the US policy, EPA, in fact the formulation of the EPA, was turned on very small uh, accumulative actions of we the people. The EPA was formed because we the people went against the tide of the government in small units and small units and small units, and finally Charlie Booster right on the East End you know, took a teaspoonful of DDT, held it up, and held it up next to an osprey egg. Uh, and the Environmental Defense Fund was born, and the EPA was born with it. It really takes this kind of consciousness, but if we don't have the two prongs, the general issue that we're looking at, the manipulation, the lying, the thieving, the connection between cancer and this and that, and the real direct need of these workers, we're going to lose. 
both of the issues have to be highlighted in tandem with each, with each other, because the reason they're not getting their needs met is the political one. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the gentleman over here with his hand raised. Oh. Hey, no, my question is a question of accountability. My name is Tom McGee, and I, and I work at the uh, Trade Center for 10 months straight, um, seven days a week. I, uh, the whole time there, FEMA was in control. FEMA paid all the bills, FEMA took care of all the decisions. FEMA did everything. Whenever we needed equipment, we came through FEMA. FEMA's not there now. FEMA is part of the federal government. Right now, everybody's looking for accountability, they're looking for help, we've got to go through the state. The president came to us and said that, <clears throat> that make no question about it, this was an act of war, it wasn't an attack on the United States, it wasn't an attack, on, uh, attack against New York, it was an attack against the United States of America. Yet, the only people that are taking care of us right now is state compensation. We're not getting anything from FEMA. We're not getting anything from the federal government. There's the Longshoremen's Act. There's federal. There are a lot of guys out there right now who are losing their homes. There are a lot of guys out there that need medical stuff taken care of. And the federal government is doing absolutely nothing for it. Okay? <clears throat> I'm pledging my time and my wife's time to John's Foundation to try to switch over state compensation to federal compensation for everybody that needs it. They were there. They supported, they helped, they were a part of building the bridge, they were part of building the hole, they were part of supplying every piece of equipment, and now they're not there when we need them now. We need their help, we need the federal government to support us, the federal government to help us, and <clears throat> we're gonna not gonna stop until we get their until we get their attention and we get their help. Thank you. say that if you took one week of the money we spent in Iraq, you could solve the problems from 9-11. <laughs> <laughs> to me when we did the investigation on the 9-11 case. I, uh, I interviewed one guy who uh, was on oxygen, he couldn't breathe, and his boss told him to not wear protective gear because we don't want you to scare the public. There you go. That's information, all this information you need to keep. Allison. Yes, I'd just like to look a little more at the larger picture since I sort of express myself about the 9-11 situation in the film. Um, we've had basically four major cataclysmic events or disasters in the United States recently. In 1989, we had the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Hardly anyone is aware of the fact that lots of those workers who worked cleaning up those oil-covered beaches are now sick. In particular, they developed multiple chemical sensitivity. Then in 1991, there was the Gulf War, and I've done the book and documentary on the Gulf War. Those people, over 200,000 of them, or that's 34% of those who served, are now chronically ill. This is according to an article by Lee Steele in the American Journal of Epidemiology published in November of 2000. And in that case, those people, um, I have yet to meet one of them who's not extremely sensitive to chemicals now. They're very reactive to pesticides, gasoline, all of these things. And then in um, 2001, of course, we had 9-11. And in that case, in 9-11, there's very serious lung damage from the caustic dust and asbestos. There are a lot of other things besides chemical sensitivity going on there. On the other hand, it's very important to understand the chemical sensitivity aspects. Multiple chemical sensitivity has been known, and there's been a whole community of these people for decades. And there's certain things that one needs to realize, like 
other doctors in New York talk about reactive airway disease and about how breathing perfume or gasoline or cigarette smoke might give someone an asthma attack, but it can also cause many other things. It can cause migraine headaches, it can cause severe memory loss, it can cause joint pains, it can cause insomnia. I mean, for instance, Alex Sanchez, that was one of the day laborers that cleaned up, I just called him yesterday to check in, and he said, I asked him how he's doing, and he said, oh, I've just started having migraine headaches. And he said, I think it's probably from stress. But then I was asking, well, is there anything you've been exposed to? And he said, well, yes, in my girlfriend's apartment where I've been staying, the neighbor next door, there's been a lot of cockroaches, and they've been fumigating. And I said, that's more likely the source of your migraine headaches. For anyone like Alex, who is now chemically sensitive, fumigation would be a huge problem. And then moving on to 2005, we have Katrina. Now, Hugh and a lot of people have begun to look at this situation. I knew from the beginning that given all the chemical spills there, and I've heard that it's the second largest <coughs> oil spill in history after Exxon Valdez, because there were all those oil refineries there, a lot of chemical factories down there, all that stuff spilled into the water. So I knew right away that we were going to have a lot of multiple chemical sensitivity developed down there. And I was also very concerned because there was almost no solution but to put these people in trailers. But anyone who knows about chemical sensitivity knows the worst possible place for a person with chemical sensitivity is a trailer. They tend to be full of formaldehyde. There was one, and I'm not saying that I see a good solution, but someone had better be studying the problem because you can manufacture trailers with lower amounts of formaldehyde, I'm told. But at any rate, something very interesting came across the internet to me a month or two ago that some woman was beginning to get sick and develop things like chemical sensitivity and was having problems in her trailer. This woman said that FEMA had actually had people sign something saying that they realized that they were basically exonerating, not going to hold FEMA liable if they developed any problems. There was an article came out, um, I forget it was AP or something, about two weeks ago, saying it's now recognized that those particular FEMA trailers are particularly high in formaldehyde. But once again, the officials, when people said these are making us sick, the officials said, oh, they just need to open up the windows. And in fact, one of them sort of made the snide remark, if they need, we will go out there and show them how to open the windows. I mean, and you cannot, that's not going to do much at all. So I just would like to make a plea that chemical sensitivity needs to be recognized because it's been going on and on. And the one curious thing I like to say in closing is that the event preceded all of these. It wasn't a national disaster, but in 1987, the EPA remodeled its offices in the Waterside Mall in Washington, D.C. and put in tons of new carpeting. And the adhesive they glued it down with was apparently a particular problem, but lots, over 100 of the employees at EPA became very sick and developed multiple chemical sensitivity. But the EPA administration thought this tooth and nail would never recognize that there were lawsuits. And you may remember it was on 60 Minutes and they got all these programs because everybody's laughing and saying, if the EPA can't get it right, who can? But what happened because of that EPA denial? See, they knew back in 1987 the chemical sensitivity was real, but they denied it. So two years later, what does the EPA do in, in Alaska? They go up there and they tell Exxon that it's just fine to use chemicals like Corex and some other very toxic chemicals to put on the oil on the beach to help dissolve. It turns out that was quite a disaster, according to most people. But better if they just done nothing. So the EPA had a hand in there. They had a slight hand in the Gulf War because they went over, interestingly enough, about two months after the oil wall fires had started burning, the EPA goes over to measure the smoke. And by this point, there had been these things called, I think it's a small winds that had shifted direction. So by that point, the places where the EPA measured, there was no longer the air inversion, so there was no longer stagnant air, it was all blowing. So the EPA measures two months after it, you know, when cars are, are on the way out, and they say, no problem, it's no worse than the air in, in Houston or Philadelphia. We're like, we all saw the pictures, do you believe that? So once again, the EPA was moving it up, 
And then in the case of 9 11, well, it's plus the, the way they messed that one up. And in Katrina, again, they're not protecting it. And um, Hugh, you may be able to tell me, but I remember hearing someone making a speech about this saying that she'd been down there working with a group of EPA people, and they were specifically instructed not to wear any EPA insignia in public, not to talk to the press, that they were, the EPA at this point was maintaining tight control. Is that what you've heard, Hugh? Well, first of all, let me just say that compared to how the EPA is now to 10, 20 years ago, if you thought they were bad 10 years ago, you ain't seen nothing, baby. <laughs> uh, but in the Katrina case, uh, basically, the, the EPA, when they were making mistakes, they were stu still too environmental for this administration. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, notwithstanding all of the government requirements that EPA has the lead in remedial actions in Katrina, the White House created a task force to deal with the Katrina case and would not allow EPA on that task force because they were too, too environmental. And, and so uh, what little environmental work actually has been done down there has been done by the Louisiana Environmental Agency. Uh, now there's a problem. Number one, Louisiana is virtually bankrupt. And number two, because of the power of the oil and chemical industry, the Louisiana Environmental Agency is really a captive of that, of that industry. And so even though you're finding high levels of benzene, lead, arsenic, uh, and toxic material throughout that area, uh, uh, the uh, Louisiana Environmental Agency and EPA has ratified that there's no environmental problems. But then when you read the fine print in the report that came out last month, it said, we don't know what kind of problems the dust of, uh, has uh, be, occurred or, or what kind of problems will occur because of all this dust. So be careful with your children not to breathe in the dust. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's really almost a comedy of errors. But I, but I, I think we, get, we have, I think everybody in America understands that toxic chemicals are dangerous and that we shouldn't be exposed to them. I, I don't think that that fight uh, needs to be done that much. Everybody knows that. The question is, are we going to enforce the laws that are on the books and strengthen the laws like health care for heroes uh, and workmen's compensation for heroes so they don't lose their homes because they're sick as dogs? I think we have to strengthen these laws, but we have to go in the other direction. We have to make EPA and state agencies better, not worse. And we should not be because uh, we, uh, what's been documented over and over by your group uh, of, of increasing incidents of contamination, we should not be reducing laboratories, reducing testing, reducing enforcement. We should be increasing that. So the direction is all wrong that we're going. We've got to go in the other direction. I find it ironic, and I've been with EPA, I was one of the people start EPA, I've been there in the beginning, I came in in the Nixon administration, and I'm sure if this administration look at, at the policies that the White House approved for us in the Nixon administration, they think Richard Nixon was a bunch, was a hippie. Um, uh, but the reality, the reality is we're going in the wrong direction. We need to be strengthening our programs, not diminishing our programs. Uh, and I, and I, I love the comment of this gentleman who, who said, think inside the box. To me, I said, we got to take care of home. we got to take care of America. we got to take care of America first. And, and it has nothing to do with Republicans or Democrats, liberals or conservatives, faith-based organizations or whatever the, the latest, you know, thing that's cool is. We need to work to make America better. That's what, that's what our country's founded on. So our kids have a better life than we had. 
and their kids will have a better life than them. And, and if, we, if we go away from America, we're not doing that. So charity and good work and, 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 and help starts at home. If, if, if you can't provide a healthy environment for your kids and your house, why are you at, the, at some local foreign bar throwing $100 bills to foreigners? Forget it. Use that money here. Strengthen, strengthen what we've got. Strengthen our infrastructure to deal with toxics. We need more laboratories. We need more tests. We need more enforcement, not less. That, and that's what you really got to do. Can I, can I just say this? I don't, I don't think the problem is that we're too charitable with foreigners. I think we're too... Uh, too I, I don't, when you say think in, inside the box, it's not that we're so charitable with uh, foreigners or that we give so much in terms of uh, foreign aid. Uh, it's that the big corporations are uh, really have top priority on, on just about everything. Let me tell you about Iraq. We sent billions of dollars of cash in bags over to Iraq. Not to help the people. people. Not to help that. those people. I understand that. And you know where the auditors for the money were? They weren't in Iraq, they were in Virginia. I know, but we're, we're not doing that to help anybody. We're doing that to help, uh, you know, no, and, and follow and this you, particular... You, that money in Iraq went to Bechtel. The same yeah, people that went down to 9-11. Exactly. Went to Bechtel, so... Well, the is the Bechtel Foundation. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. 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 I've got uh, a woman here, a Susan Berlin, who is our councilwoman. And um, I'd like her to say a few remarks because Huntington, a little township in the county of Suffolk, in the state of New York, um, part of the United States of America, has started a lot. So maybe you were thinking on your feet, maybe I'm putting you on a spot, I don't know, but there's something that can start in the town of Huntington. And then I think um, I'm going to go back to the directives of our marching orders of specificity about um, what we're going to do, aside from share names with each other and be in contact with one another and make ourselves available to one another and tell other people about what's happening because we can just hear it and absorb it all. So these numbers of maybe a hundred and some odd people have to be three hundred and some odd people. And um, I think you're well on your way. Yeah, I, I echo that. I really want to thank Karen for putting this together. It's uh, it's incredible, and she had asked me to come, and I'm glad the other event I was supposed to be at canceled, so I was able to be here. And I just have to tell you, Allison and I, I was watching it for the first time in my life. It's like the day when I was a senior in high school and I was told you're dyslexic, which is where I realized I had trouble reading. I have multiple chemical sensitivity. They laugh at me in town hall because they can't paint when I'm in town hall. They can't clean my office with the cleaners because I get headaches. I look like a, like a raccoon by the end of the day. You know, my mother used to put uh, bleach on the floors, and I used to just get dizzy and have to leave the house. And, you know, there's actually a name to it. So I, I empathize so much. You know, John and I met, met the other day, and if, and if you, I mean, I've lived with this since I was a little kid. And to, you know, to give back and to be a, a volunteer and to go there at 9-11 and then to end up suffering from this as well as everything else. I mean, my heart goes out to, to all of you. And, you know, I, I, I want you to know that, you know, in, in, in a personal capacity, as an individual, and also as a councilwoman in the town of Huntington, whatever I can do. I mean, I'm the lowest rung on the political pole, I know that. But whatever I can do, you, you have my pledge, you have my support, Karen knows how to get me, and I, I can't speak for my colleagues, but I'm sure they you know, would, would join in as well. Anything we can do in Huntington to maybe have other programs, maybe do things like this through the schools and get more parents out, and really you know, wake everybody up. Because that's the problem. We, we have to wake up to this. You know, Joan and I have been at various events where we got to see each other and really you know, learn about this. But we need to get the word out. So anything I can do in the town of Huntington to help make that happen, just, just don't hesitate to call on me. Thank you, Susan. I want to thank this beautiful panel that came out today and expressed and, and enlightened this group 
and I've been working with, I've had the pleasure to work with Karen and everybody else on the Prevention is the Cure Committee. And um, what I want to bring out is that it comes to mind three very important things that all of us could do. And one is educate ourselves. Because bring this back to your homes and to your communities, everything that you've learned today. And then also to support environmental health research. Starting with what Leo, Dr. Leo Trasante said, that we need those environmental health centers because without what the seeds that Mount Sinai sown, none of this awareness and none of this moving forward would be going on. I've been working with researchers that have been doing envi on environmental health, including breast cancer, and they are the lowest on the totem pole. Only one penny out of every dollar goes to breast cancer environmental health research. And that's outrageous, since less than 10% of all breast cancer is due to genetics or family history. The third very important thing is that we have environmental, legisla environmental health legislation right now in New York State that is provided in the packets uh, that Karen and, and her group prepare. And so please take a look at that legislation and call up your senators, call up your assemblymen, and tell them that you want these things passed because this ultimately is what's going to protect us. Thank you. Thank you, Let me just, let me just interject on that. Uh, you guys can call your legislators, assembly and senate people, they're not gonna answer your phone call. Two paragraphs, notarized and handwritten, will get documented in a uh, book, and they have to look at it. People do not know this. You wow. can send as many emails as you want, it's not gonna be looked at. It's really important to know when one person does that, they count a thousand votes for every person who sends uh, an unsigned notarized letter. They what they see, they telescope everything out. When one person does that, in their minds, it becomes a thousand of their voters. So it's a very effective thing to do. Right. Stay away from form letters and spend the time and write a letter yourself. That's gets the politician to come in office. I see 40 letters about a particular issue. People spend the time to hand write. I know that as an elected official, I need to pay attention to that. And uh, that's what one of the politicians told me. And uh, I never forgot that. So I tell everyone all the time again, write the personal hand letter. Don't store phone letters or emails. Please stop it. And send it. Return receipt requested. Got two people here, and then, um, so you're all ready for your pen. You're ready? Okay. Hi, my name is Susan, and, uh, I'm the wife of a first responder, uh, Greg Lopez. Um, I'm also an EAP counselor, uh, which means an employee assistance program counselor for Teamsters, operating engineers, carpenters. I work with some of the gentlemen who were the first responders. Um, there's a high rate of drug and alcohol abuse. There's a high rate of suicide. There's a high rate of family problems. This is not being addressed. I mean, aside from the lives that it's ripped apart as far as the physical, what's done with Bonnie, with Greg, with, with Marvin, with John, how sick you people are. Um, it's not only it's not only done that damage, it's damaged families, it's torn families apart. And people need to get that message clear too. Because um, you know, if you ask my daughter, she'll tell you she lost her father on 9-11. He may not be in a box, but, you know, as Bobby said, part of her died and she doesn't know what, you know, where it is and if she'll ever get her back. And it's true. And for wives like Lena and I, you know, we don't really have our husbands. You know, we have the shelves of the people that we knew, and we love them and we try to support them, but, you know, Families are being torn apart. Kids don't have their parents anymore. That has to be addressed also. Because you guys, you know, these first responders are fighting just to just to breathe every day, just to live every day. You know? And then on top of that, they've got all these problems with their children, with their families being ripped apart. That needs to be addressed. That needs to be brought to light. That's important. Thank you. Can I add something to that, please? Susan, uh, any psychological practice
practitioner that's a, a professional will tell you that the individual that's afflicted with psychological trauma four to six years after suffering his experience with that trauma is when the symptoms show up most fervently and uh, what we deal with, and my wife is right here in the audience, and anybody can ask her afterwards. What we deal with is not so much just cases of people who want to commit suicide, but predominantly what I'm dealing with, psychologically now we're speaking, is the children of those responders who are practicing or trying to practice what their parents have showed them is a way to remedy any problems that you have. So now we have the children participating in an event that they're trying to duplicate what their parents showed them is a way out of dealing with your problems. And unfortunately, kids are what? They are extremely influential. So. What I am really trying to say is not only to give an answer and to affirm what you just said, but also that the group that we've started, we're very fortunate. We work with several psychological counseling centers, and one of them is Faithful Response. And uh, we have direct outlet. So if anybody here knows of anybody who needs any kind of counseling, pertaining to 9-11, Katrina, Wilma, Rita, whatever it is, please come contact us, okay? Because we do have a direct outlet for people who are afflicted. A lot of people don't understand why we sit up here and do what we do. And I can tell you right now, when the first volunteer firefighter died in 2002, we knew we were gonna die, okay? With the passing of time, I was buried alive twice with 30 people, three of them are dead. This is a reality we deal with every day. Yes, it's part of life, life and death, I'll give you that. But this is something that's been forced upon us to sit and address every day. September 11th, I spent the whole day in the doctor's office. I still, I may look great on the outside, but I have muscle spasms as I'm sitting here. I've been dizzy all day. I'm nauseous. But I still get up every day and do the best I can. I have people that called me the whole week before September 11th. We had a 2P, two people, which means we had to have a psychiatric screening team go out there and take them out of their house. We had one paramedic at this point who has not left his room unless he's taken out by the crisis team because he has blackened out his windows and does not want to face the world anymore. That day was a day of infamy we will never, never forget. That day was also a day of humanity that many people don't realize that the first five letters of humanity is human. We don't get that we're all bonded together is a big problem here. We've already lost the battle, okay? Things need to sit and change. It doesn't only start with us. It starts with you. Because things in time do change, if you believe in it. If you believe that this is not going to get any better, then you, you, we, we're defeated already. You know, like John said and Marvin said, at this point, we don't know how much longer we have to live. And do you go through the fear that, yes, oh my God, someone I was buried with died again. It is. It's there. This is, a, this is a fact. My partner called me yesterday. She's got nodules. She's got heart problems. And most likely she's got cancer. My captain has cancer. This is a reality. A reality that not only affects me, but the children. At that time, I was in a relationship with a partner. And the girl now, I started, she was seven years old. Nine, nine years old when 9-11 happened. She's 16 now. And to this day, she does not understand. This is a teenager. 
So this is the misnomer that we're living under, that you keep on sweeping us underneath the rug or leaving us buried alive or, or part of the dust at ground zero. You can build over us, but we're not going away. Uh, I'd just like to say also, uh, in my 23 years as a medic, I had a put to my head twice. I was shot at once. And nothing compares to what happened to that building with them. If you talk about the psychological aspect of it, you know, we are sick. Like yesterday, I had a very bad day psychologically because the governor is signing a bill that benefits some other people, but yet we're constantly being denied. And so I understand clearly what you mean by psychologically. I mean, I'm single, I live by myself, but I had such rage. All I wanted to do yesterday was break things. I had at the point now, I don't even like driving. When I drive at times, I experience a rage at times when I just want to almost run somebody over. I was never like that. Uh, just to show you, I bring this with me to illustrate a point. Before 9 11, I took two medicines for ultimate coins. I was athletic. I ran like a deer, I kicked the ball to the second baseman, I beat the ball to the first at 39. I took great pride in that. Today, I walk up two flights of stairs from up in the apartment because of the 9 11. This is what I take currently. I'm 46 years old. So, you know, we're struggling psychologically to put a tremendous strain on all of us. And the government needs to take a more responsible attitude to take care of us. Uh, it's quite a bit of war with the governor because uh, since we're in the EMSs in New York City, unfortunately, what most people don't realize, 40% of the EMSs in New York City was private hospitals and not the city of New York. So we get to dispatch to your house for emergency, but when it comes to benefits, we're not considered city employees. So the governor is constantly giving benefits to the city paramedics, EMTs, and the police department, but yet 11 of us, four of us were killed. I was actually with one of the guys on 9 11. And he walked into the building so he got to find his wife. And uh, she got out. He never did get out. And seven of us are permanently disabled. And the government won't give us a pre quarter disability benefit, which is an absolute disgrace. So when you talk about psychological, yesterday when they sent me the email that the governor did sign another bill benefiting a fireman, I just went ballistic. So I clearly understand what you say about psychologically. So every day for us, it is a struggle. So basically, Bonnie and Marvin have told us that um, not all the heroes are getting the help that they need. And Bonnie said, write a letter, register, and it'll count. So that clearly is something that we need to do with our local and county and state and federal legislators. What is that? Ten letters each? We can do that, and we can tell people to do that. Ken, would you like to give us some directives? And then Leo and Joel and... Sure, I, I, well, uh, first, I, we need to help these folks. Um, in what, whatever way makes the most sense to get the, uh, the care and, and the treatment of that, uh, that you learned and need, um, and whatever actions need to be taken, I, I think all of us need to stand up and, and help with that. And my organization is going to continue to do it. We're going to redouble our efforts after today. Um, I'd, I'd like to put in a plug for uh, uh, Prevention is the Cure and, and uh, Unsung Heroes Helping Heroes. The, and the, Environmental Working Group. No, I'm not going to put in a plug. No, but that, that, I'm not yeah. going to put in a plug well, for that. I'm, yeah, I'm going to put in a plug for the, and, and Allison, I, 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 I don't have in front of me the name of your organization, but I, but, but I want to put in a plug is, you know, support them. Uh, you know, write them, a, write them a check, even if it's a small check, so they can keep doing their, their good work. Um, and then the final thing I want to suggest, and, and uh, Laura was kind enough to print out a, a, a page from our website. This is a, a page down here that uh, documents one of the first things we did to, to test the, the what we call the pollution in people. You know, scientists have been studying it in air and water and land for, for decades, but we're starting now to look at what's in all of us. Uh, this, is a, this is a chart of uh, some of the chemicals that were in one person. Uh, not a, again, not a person who's exposed, you wouldn't think, to industrial chemicals every day, has an office job, 
talks on the phone, eats, drinks, doesn't do anything, uh, you know, crazy like the uh, uh, an iron worker doing all this wild stuff uh, for their whole career. Just, uh, you know, uh, living a, a white collar life. And she had all these things in her body. We need to fix the law that's allowing this to continue. And it's called the Toxic Substances Control Act. It was written largely by industry in 1976 and has never been reauthorized or modernized or updated. Imagine the science we had in 1976 about toxic chemicals in our health and exposures and all that. Imagine that is what's really governing us now. This law is so weak that the EPA couldn't use it to ban asbestos. <laughs> they tried, and they lost in court because the law's so weak. There's a fix that Senator Clinton has supported and others have supported called the Kids Safe Chemical Act that would overhaul the Toxic <coughs> Substances Control Act, bring it into modern uh, times with modern science and tough standards. And it basically says, among other things, if we're finding lots of toxic chemicals in people, we ought to know, we ought to damn well know what those chemicals safety and risks are. We ought to start there. If we're finding them in people. If we're finding them in babies before they come out of the womb. We're finding them in cord blood afterwards. We ought to know that all of those chemicals are safe, or we ought to be not using them and not having these exposures. And we can do it. And every time you hear a chemical company or a big manufacturer say, if we do something to restrict a chemical or ban a chemical, uh, we're going to go out of business. The economy will end. Just remember, they said that about DDT. They said that about lead and gasoline. They said that about uh, PCBs. They say it about everything, right? And somehow, we invent our way out of it. We're, we use our ingenuity. We come up with something safer, or try to anyway. The old stuff sometimes is still with us, even in babies. But at least we took action. And I think this, uh, this law called the Kids Safe Chemical Act, introduced by Frank Lautenberg in the Senate, um, and supported by Senator Clinton and others, companion bill in the House is a is a very important step. Kids safe chemical the Kids act. Safe chemical act. We have um, if anybody wants index cards and pencils. We have you know that um, uh, equipment for you to write those things down and pass it on. Can I just build on uh, what Ken's saying? And, and I'll, I'll to Ken's form. Uh, EWG.org is a great website to look in more detail about the work uh, that they've done looking at body burden in kids and in the general public. But let me, um, let me open that up for a second and just make a point that let's say you bring, let's say you had had this done and you brought this into a pediatrician's office, brought this to an adult practitioner's office. Um, the average pediatrician or average any doctor would just shrug their shoulders and go, I don't know what's going on with these chemicals. I don't know what it's going to mean for your long-term health. I tend to know more than others because I have special training in environmental pediatrics. But the fact is, as Dr. Levin said in that video, the average medical school has two to three hours of occupational medicine in their programs. One heart surgery, and I got subjected to more than my share of them, is six hours of clinical training time just to give you a sense of the order of magnitude that occupational medicine gets in the medical curriculum. We need to improve knowledge among the medical community as well. We also need to improve scientific knowledge. If we can't get a kid safe chemical act in, in this current climate, we've got some hope in the long term with something like the National Children's Study, which is generally going to provide information about all issues in child health. It's going to be something that pediatricians look at. And, and I realize I'm, I've got a pediatrician bias here, but I'm, I'm going to explain what I know and point out that it's through that kind of scientific knowledge and clinical knowledge about toxins that we can push back against the hand weedy argument that this chemical isn't a problem in this population or that chemical or that health issue isn't a real problem. With sound science and with sound clinical knowledge, we can get the word, the, the, the word out and, and beat back the opponents who will say that this isn't a big problem. Thank you. So that's the National Children's Study. So we'll take that down. John. Well, my recommendation comes from a civil rights and environmental justice lawyer. At first, what I would love the government is to act, come in and save everybody. 
and I think we will all try to get through that. But even more fundamental than that is our right to know. After Bull Powell, we learned that without knowing what's in that factory down the block, what's in that smokestack, what was in that World Trade Center, we can't do anything. We can't respond. We can't respect we protect the responders. Right now, we know less what's in that building down the block. We have less of a right to know than we did right before 9-11. In the last five years, the government has decimated a community right to know law, a freedom of information laws, all those laws. In New York City, and it's probably similar to the state, that when there was a, 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 an emergency, an incident, like the World Trade Center, it was the fire department that responded and gave us all that information, the hazmat team, let us know what we were exposed to, let us know that there was secret service um, munitions in the, in the World Trade Center, there was a customs lab. Now the police department has taken over the FBI, and every time they tell us that this is an ongoing criminal investigation. So what I urge everyone is to go to our website, www, and we'll post it there, nyenvironmentallaw.org. And there's a model, dot org. There's a model freedom of information request form, and I urge you to use it once a month to your city, county, or state government something that you want to know, you put down and you ask them in that form. And we'll help you follow up with that when they don't answer and there's ways of doing it. And that's the first way to hold them accountable, is to make sure that you have the right to that information. The second thing is, we want to make sure that there's a proper whistleblower law in this state. There's a not law? whistleblower law. Okay? Minna pointed out that the way that we found information in a lot of the breakthroughs is when a worker gets hurt, and, and, and bothers to speak up, sometimes forced to speak up, and let people know what's going on in that place, how they're being treated. They're being treated bad with those chemicals. Those chemicals are going up that smokestack. <clears throat> I got called a week ago by a sergeant, pre-9-11, that, that was, was guys in his, his police station in the Bronx were dying because there was leaking gas tank with fuels coming up. The city heard that the union was, was actually going to do a lawsuit and they transferred him about 50 times and forced him out of his job. And right now, he's trying to save him. Whatever he's got left, he's been fired. What you see here are people that, that, that basically almost gave their lives. But you don't see firefighters and police officers and other people who work for the city because they're not allowed to speak. If they came out and were on this panel and told you what they're going through, they'd be fired and they wouldn't even make it home before the fire was there. So on our website is Information, freedom of information law requests, there's information about how to do a community right to know request, and also information about whistleblower laws. If we don't protect those workers and their right to speak out, and if we don't have that information, we're covered. Thank you. www.nyenvirolaw.org. Thank you. Uh, Laura? <coughs> Um, we have about 80 of these DVDs, environmental risks. Um, it's, they talk about the risk with breast cancer, but however, this is very far-reaching. It talks about what you can do in your home, in your communities. It is highly educational. It's a great first step to for an understanding about environmental health and how to protect yourselves. So. Um, if you're interested, the box is here. Please take one home. Thank you. Film on Capitol Hill on October 11th, from 1 to 3 in the afternoon. And my foundation, the Chemical Sensitivity Foundation, will be giving a copy to every member of Congress. Now, Congress, of course, will not be in session, but it's more likely that this, the staff members will be free to come when Congress is not in session. And I hope that this is the first they've heard of the date, but I hope that John and Bonnie and Marvin may be free to come. And I just found out from Congresswoman Maloney's office a day or two ago that they have a room for that day. And I would love to show this film anywhere around the country that you know of. I'm trying to get word out. I gave a copy of my Go For Syndrome documentary to every member of Congress. I'll give a copy of my book to every member of Congress. So try to educate those. Thank you. Remind everybody to please take Prevention is the Cure packets and know that Prevention is the Cure has run these programs for the last seven years. We really want and love our partnerships um, that are looking and pushing for more environmental health. Please go on to our newly revamped website, 
DimensionIsTheCure.org. We ask for your support as well. I want to thank Gene Taylor and also let you know that he has been Gratis, our videographer for the film and the panel discussion and all the things that have enlightened me. Gene has done these things before on very, very meaningful events. He works for, for is it for peace? peace? North North Country Peace Group. North Country Peace Group. He is going to be putting together this uh, panel discussion and the film, our comments, and putting it on a trailer. He spends a great deal of his, quote, retired time trying to get public TV to air these films. All of this is really grassroots, and it definitely takes grassroots to push the envelope. We've done it before. We can do it again. We need to stay connected. And thank you very, very much for coming to you.